17 U.S.C. 107 federal law allows citizens to use copyrighted media for fair use. That is criticism, news reporting, teaching, and parody. Kuma, ye hawa. We are put so all ye there, Kuma, ye hawa. We are put so all ye there, Kuma, ye hawa. We are put so all ye there, Kuma, ye hawa. We are put so all ye there, Kuma, ye hawa. We are put so all ye there, O oh, Yahweh, let your enemies be scattered, and let those that hate thee flee from before thee. Let all of Yasharah, Yisrael, who love, worship, and praise Yahweh, give him thanks by saying hallelujah. Shalom, family, and welcome to Live Light Well into All Truth. I pray that the Ruach HaKodesh will lead you into all truth and show you things to come, and that the seed of Yah's word will be planted firmly in your heart so you be rooted and grounded in love to know what the hope of your calling is, the inheritance of the saints, and Yah's, what Yah's riches of his glory are. And I pray the Ruach HaKodesh will show you things to come. I pray this in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach and that this everything would be anointed and that the seed of this word would be sown to bring forth righteousness in your heart. Amen. So family, today I'm going to share with you like my <laughs> song that I just wrote. And listen, the recording is not the best, uh, but I just, I know about a month ago I was led to sing the song of Passover, Exodus 15. And so went through quite a, quite a process to write it. I went to a bunch of other people to sing it or write it. And people did write their, I think one person wrote a song, but it was to an existing tune. And so, and other people have been working on it, but I just sense a, have a real sense of urgency about this song getting out. And so um, people are continuing to work on the translation of it, even though the translation of Hebrew was actually in Israel. It was a combination of Canaan, Canaanitish languages and Arabic, which would be languages Esau, Edom was associated with. And of course we know the Abantus, the Patois of, of uh, the West Indies is probably closer to the original languages, although they will. And as well, probably, you know, some of the Ethiopian uh, Hebrew that's spoken. So we don't really have an original, true, pure source of the language. So I just kind of went with this based on words I found. It's not going to be perfect, but uh, I hope you, I'm going to play it at the end of the video. So, and definitely it's not like the best recording, but it's a start. I wrote it in eight days. I got it on the Shabbat just between midnight and 1 a.m., and then, yeah, it took about eight days to write it. But really what this video is about is actually the scepter of Damascus. I've been wanting to do this for a very long time. And I've done this in pieces because there's just so much going on. I just feel like I need to update you guys on what is going on currently. And so once again, prophecy, all of this is for your edification, but most primarily the song, which is at the end. And please, please. <laughs> <laughs> don't be too critical uh, so again we're going to talk about the shift from Bianco to Nero and this is probably really the last video in that series and so let's get into the scepter of Damascus and the return of Yesharel so the scepter of Damascus this picture I've been showing you throughout this whole 
Negro to Blanco series, the transition of Israel being called Yah's people to the Gentiles taking over that identity, is very well depicted in this picture. But indeed, it also relates something else. It also relates and reveals the theft of the scepter of Damascus, if you look very closely in the hand of this man right here. What is he holding? A scepter. And this is why Judah is looking on with such a quizzical look. Peep this. I also address the matter of the image of the two twins depicted in this picture. To the left we see Jacob, and to the right we see Esau. And he's wearing his ring, earring in his ear. And of course he transforms into this golub who has stolen the scepter. But once again, we see this twinning image, and I'm gonna speak to this as well because this is also the switch from Blanco or black back to Negro for the Hebrews, from black back to Hebrew Israel. But it's also the return of the Sabaeans and Esau's attempt to usurp the rise of Israel through the rise of the Sabaeans. And that is how he will capitalize on the enslavement of the Gentiles through the Antichrist reign. And so though he has masqueraded as this Golub looking fellow in his Gentile identity, he will now return to the identity of the Sabaeans. So let's get into both parts of that story. Of course, we'll start with Shem's portion because of course Shem was the favored firstborn son. So you're gonna see these review sparkles for the review portion if you wanna come back in about 20 minutes, guys. But this is again review of from the last video and then we're gonna go forwards, okay? And of course, he got all the land east of Eden. And that's why he was so blessed and so highly favored. And of course we have the three sons. Now, I was listening to one of my elders and he's like, they didn't come out all different colors. And it's like, no, I don't believe they came out all different colors. They all came out the same, you know, as sons of uh, Noah. However, because of the regions of the earth they dwelt in, they then got darker because the land of Ham is a land in the south of the burnt faces and in the north, is the cooler land it's cold and very cold is the land of Yafeth and of course Shem retained the original color which was a burnished brass and we find that the term Gentile in the form Gawi applies to all of the offspring of Noah including the fallen okay nations Gawi now Gentile is in particular a term given Goy to Japheth and his offspring, as we see here. So most particularly the Gentiles, the descendants of Japheth are called Gentiles, but generically all nations are also called Gentiles. But this in this scripture was a way that they define their lands according to the names of the sons of Japheth. And so they named their nations after their offspring. So Genesis 5.10 says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, and their nations. But Gawi, or Gawi, is also a term for nation given for, to all sons of sons outside of the family of Yasharal after Abraham begat Isaac and Isaac began, begat Jacob and forwards, okay? So you see that Ham after their sons in their countries and their nations, Gawi, and that includes the offspring of Canaan and the sons of Shem after their nations, Gawi. Gawi means nations. Another way that this is revealed is that the nations are often associated with non-fruit bearing trees non-fruit bearing trees and of course Nebuchadnezzar has this great dream of this fruitless tree of Babylon that spreads over the entire earth okay this great oak 
Now, Israel is never associated with any great oaks. Israel is always associated with fruit-bearing trees. So let's get to Japheth's role in all of this, and then we'll go over, switch over to Ham, and what the Esau and the Antichrist will be doing with Ham. So as we know, as I've said before, the role of Japheth is to return the bride. And we know that Eliezer was the servant of Abraham, who was given the task of finding a bride for Isaac and then returning her to Isaac, bringing her to Isaac with all of these costly stones and jewels that were given for her dowry. Genesis 24, 2. Abraham was old and went well stricken in age, and, the, and Yahuwah blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. So he's making a covenant with him. And here we see, again, ruled over all that he had. So Eliezer the Gentile is ruling over all that Abraham had at this time, okay? And I will make thee swear by Yah, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, Preadventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again to the land from whence thou came? So in other words, so if the woman won't come with me, should I go get Isaac and bring him over? And then it says, Yahuwah of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, which spoke unto me and swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give the land. He shall send an angel before you, and you shall take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman not be not willing to follow thee, then you shall be clear from this oath. Only bring not my son over there to that land again. So don't bring my son to them, bring the bride to my son. So Isaac is a type of Messiah, and so the bride must be brought to the Messiah. And what's happening is that Eliezer is going to the former land of the captivity of Abraham. So that's why he doesn't want Isaac going there. And so... Eliezer is going to the land of captivity to bring the bride back to the free man, to the groom, and he's going to take wealth given to him by Abraham, and he currently has all of Abraham's wealth. He's overseeing all of Abraham's wealth. So this is just like Japheth currently has all of Israel's wealth, and he has the bride, and the bride is captive, okay? And so the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning the matter. In other words, he made an oath that he would do it. And so then he takes 10 camels and he goes to um, the city of Nahor. And then he goes to water his camels. And when the women came out to draw water, then he saw that there was a woman there who came and drew water for the 10 camels he was with. And he says to himself, well, let it come to pass that the woman who, to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher and I pray to you that I may drink and she shall say drink and I will give you thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou has appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou has showed kindness unto thy master. So if she draws water for me and for the camels, then I know that the spirit of Yahuwah is with me and the angel of Yah is with me. And so that is actually what happens. And the damsel is very fair to look upon. She fills up her pitcher 
gives him a drink and then they go back to her house for him to, and he lodges there in the house of Laban. Laban means white, okay? And so there they are still in the land of captivity, the land of white in, there is Japheth in the land of white, in the land of captivity. And he tells the woman all about the land of promise and the groom. And then this is when Rebecca decides to accept the engagement. And of course, this is after Eliezer sits down and has a meal. So he eats from the table of the Shemites. He feasts and he has the wealth of Abraham. So a table is prepared for him. Okay, so this is Japheth's time as Eliezer feasting on the things of the descendants of the Shemites and Israel. Okay, and so he invites Rebecca and he tells her of the story of the feeding of the water and then of her, the sign being that she would give water and that it turned out that she was from the exact family he was seeking. And then consequently, he stays all night and in the morning they go and they return to the land of Abraham. And in verse 2450, Eliezer speaks with Laban, the brother of uh, Rebecca, and with Bethuel, and said, If this thing proceeds from Yahuwah, we cannot speak unto thee bad or good. So Bethuel and Laban say, Well, if this is of the Creator, then we can't say anything about it. So behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go and let her be thy master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken, as he who has spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped Yahuwah, bowing himself to the earth. So now he is worshipping Yah. So this is what the, the Japheth will have to do is submit himself to Yah, okay, and admit that he is Yah. And it says, and then the servant, Eliezer, brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah and gave them and gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. So this is the precious gold and silver that is Israel and those who are claimed clothed in righteousness, their fine raiment. And they did eat and drink and the men that were with them tarried all night and they rose up in the morning. And he said, send me away unto my master. So then Eliezer returns to serve Abraham and brings the bride. So this is what will happen to the Gentiles. They, those who cling to Israel, will return to the promised land as servants to Israel, and they must bring the bride with them. They must bring the children of Israel with them in order to enter in. And we'll just quickly review this. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Maedai, and Yavan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tirach. Okay? But we can see that the firstborn was Gomer, then Magog, and the third and the fourth were Maedai and Yavan. And, of course, they have a very specific role, just like Israel. They correspond with the third and fourth son of Jacob who were the king and the priest. And so Madai is the third son and um, Yavan the fourth. Okay. Just like Le Levi was the third born son and Judah was the fourth. And Madai is where the Medo-Persians come from and Cyrus and also uh, Eliezer of Damascus. And of course, we know the sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, right? And Ashkenaz is who the so-called Jewish people are descended from. And of course, the sons of Yavan were Elisha, Elisha, so the Isles of Elisha. And Eli means, means angel or, or Yah or God or one who will see God. We talked about that before, one who will see Yah. 
And also, these are where the ships of Tarshish come from. And these are the people who bring home the sons and daughters of Israel. So, and we also, you know, we know the Medo-Persians are the ones who call for the rebuilding of the temple. So it's the descendants of these people, which is why current Israel in America today hate the true Iranian Medo-Persians so much, because they will be part of repatriating the true Israel. That's why they're constantly persecuting them. And they had this brotherly covenant with Israel via Eliezer and Abraham and then Cyrus with Shem and the rebuilding of the temple. And then, of course, with Madai initially marrying into the Shemitic line with the Shemitic wife. So there's this whole tradition of Shemitic women in the line of Japheth, okay? Japheth dwelling in the tents of Shem. So let's go into the, the little bit about the curse that the Medo-Persians are under here and the fall of Damascus, the fall of the Gentile Empire. When the scripture speaks of the scepter of Damascus, this is what it has to say. I will break also the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the plain of Avin and him that holdeth the scepter from the house of Eden. And the people of Syria shall go into captivity Unto Kerr, saith Yahuwah. So we know Syrians have been going into captivity. Isaiah 27, the burden of D Damascus. Behold, D Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap, which, is, which happened in 2014. I've gone over this already. The fortress shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria, and they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, says the Most High of hosts. In other words, they're going to be reaping it, and they're going to be falling. Why? Uh, Jeremiah says, Damascus is wax feeble and turneth herself to flee, for fear has seized on her. Anguish and sorrows have taken her as a woman in travail. So now she's the woman in travail. Amos 1.13, thus says Yahuwah, for three transgressions of Damascus for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Because they have threshed Gilead, that's Israel. They've threshed Israel, Gilead. They've threshed Israel with threshing instruments of iron. Who's the iron kingdom? Russia. Who's the iron kingdom? All of Babylon. What did Cain slay Abel with? The iron part of his plow. The iron part of his plow. The Iron Kingdom is the fourth beast, which also has, you know, in its third leopard iteration, had the wings of an eagle. And so um, they have threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron because they carried away the captive of the whole of the captivity to deliver them up to Edom and remembered not the brotherly covenant. So that's why the Gentiles... The Medo-Persians of Damascus are in trouble, okay? But again, the salvation of the Medo-Persian Empire is that they did graft in with Israel on the female side, with Shem initially, and then with Israel through Esther. And so uh, they have, and then of course, as I've said before, Saul went to Damascus first, which is their empire, which is where Hamashiach was preached first was in Damascus. And there was a lot of interrelating. Um, there was a king of Damascus who turned white with leprosy, who one of the prophets, Elijah, had healed of his leprosy. So there's some very ironic coincidences in here. Uh, and he's considered to be the priest, the priest in a sense of uh, the Gentile nations. And it even says that here when we go to this uh, quote about Cyrus. And now, of course, everyone says it's Trump, but of course that's absolutely impossible because then they wouldn't be at war with Iran because <laughs> Iran is the Medo-Persian Empire. But anyway, let's get into the scripture. So here's the significance of Cyrus and the Medo-Persians. First at Ezra 1, 1 through 8. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of Yahuwah by the mouth of Jeremiah would be fulfilled. So Jeremiah's prophecy would be fulfilled. Yahuwah stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus. 
of Persia that he made a proclamation throughout his kingdom and put it into writing saying, Thus saith Cyrus king of Persia, the Lord Yah, Yahuwah of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he's charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is Yahuda. And so who among you is all of his people? Yah be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Yahuda, and build the house of Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel. For he is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever remaineth in any place where he sojourns, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold and with goods and with beasts beside free will offerings for the house of Yah that is in Jerusalem. And then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them, with the, the spirit of Yahuwah, had raised up to go build the house of Yahuwah which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about him strengthened their hands with vessels of silver and gold and goods and with beasts and with precious things beside all that was willingly offered. Also Cyrus the king brought forth vessels of the house of Yahuwah, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem and had them put in the house of his gods. But even those did Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of Methrodath, the treasurer, and numbered them to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. So all the vessels that the previous czars of the Medo-Persian Empire had taken and put in their gods' houses, they, he then took out and gave back to Judah to go back and rebuild the temple. And so here is the prophecy in Isaiah, Cyrus prophesied in Ezra 1 and 3, Thus says Yahuwah, his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him, to loose the armor of kings. This is the prophecy even now. To open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. So this is a prophecy of the Cyrus of today, eternally opening these doors, giving back the scepter of Damascus, allowing Yehuda to return so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. So he's cutting down the iron kingdom, Yahuwah is. And I will give you treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Most High, who call you by your name, am Elohim of Yasharel. So, very interesting here is that this is also the opening of the treasures of Yasharel to Cyrus and the Gentile Empire at that time. And then now for Cyrus to perform the same function to open those two leaved gates, not just for the Gentiles because their empire is going down, but now to in order to keep the promise once again to Yasharel, for Yasharel to enter in again and return the scepter of Damascus to Yasharel. So to Israel, I'm saying to Israel, I am Elohim of Israel for Jacob, my servant's sake and Israel, my elect. I have even called you by your name. I have named you though you have not known me. So this is the Gentiles. I am Yahuwah, and there is no other. There is no Elohim besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, Gentile Cyrus, that they may know from the rising of the sun to the setting that there is none besides me. I am Yahuwah, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, Yahuwah, do all these things. So the demise and of Israel and the rise of the Gentiles and now the demise of the Gentiles and the rise of Israel is all in the hands of Yah. And now we see these images of the Europeans and I wanted to mention them because these are the Europeans. These are sort of what you would call maybe the halflings if this was the Hobbit or something like that. Um, or, or, you know, Game of Thrones. Uh, these are the people who were mixed with the fallen seed, the descendants of the Canaanites, those who came up from under the sea, 
And these are the people who were in Western Europe. And you notice there's always this schism between Eastern and Western Europe. And I think I've kind of figured it out based on showing you this image of um, the seal of the earth, of the true land of Shem coming out. And it looks like a lot of it was actually in Western Europe and the UK and so on. And you notice that a lot of these Europeans who are in this part of the world are blonde or they have features um, that are a lot more in line with the Neanderthal or Canaanite seed, the French, the, um, the Nordic peoples with the extremely blonde hair. This is more the Anglos, the Anglos who are mixed in with Isaac's son. So Anglo-Saxons, okay? Um, so that's just kind of how I'm seeing it because these terms can really get confusing. So as I've said before, Israel has been trodden down by the Gentiles. And now I believe that part of that territory is actually Spain and everything west of the Black Sea. And I really think that is why um, Italy or, or the, the realm of Chittim is where Edom actually dwelt. But that's just something I'm speculating on. But here's more evidence as to who the Europeans really are. 18th chapter of the book of Quran. Whoa, look it. Let's read it. <laughs> and they say, O Zolkarmim, Gog and Magog people do great mischief in the earth. Shall they render thee tribute in order that they might you might erect a barrier or a wall between them? That's right. Uh, what about the historical reference in the book that I showed you not too long ago? I don't know where I put it at, but I'm going to find it. Dealing with the making of the Euro Gentile, the white man. In one of the sections in here, it says, And Moses, for Moses knew their intent, was responsible for erecting a wall. 666 miles from one end of the caucus to the other end of the caucus to keep the barbarians, to keep Gog and Magog from descending down from the north into the Holy Land. Y'all didn't hear that, did you? Mm. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's Hallelujah. why I put all these books up for you to read. I ain't making this up. This is Man. historical books. These are by scholars. They've done their research. Isn't there nobody right, copy, click, and paste? So I told you about how Esau mixed in with Gog and Magog, and he mixed in with the nations, and in particular the fallen nations with Ishmael, uh, who was Egyptian, um, but in particular the fallen nations up in the area of Gog and Magog and Ashkenaz and so on and so forth. And so this is how everyone went from black to white and i told you again before about how the janissaries perfectly imitated these people who enslaved them we saw the image of ishmael went going up north and enslaving the slavics they're called slavics because they were slaves they were slaves now the, they're mocked by the west for having been enslaved but of course this was the root of esau taking a stronghold among the gentiles and then moving west into the land of Yasharel to take it over. And of course, we know that Tewedros, uh, who was really the last great king, last great genetic king of Yasharel, and you see the similarities in the face and the forehead. I'll show you Malcolm X later with a lot of the Hebrews. Uh, not this big sort of light bulb shaped head like the, the great white aliens, but more so this, um, rounded forehead you see Malcolm X has it this is remember I talked about how the caliphate were going after Tuedros and he went to complain to the Queen of England to ask for military reinforcement and support and they did nothing and so what he did was he held on to one of their ambassadors or that's the story which I believe it's a lie it's probably just a story and then the the British sent in like something like 13,000 troops. Check it out in, in my last couple of videos. I can't remember the number, but that was how he was defeated and his son was taken to England. So how now was England taken over by Esau? 
Well, we'll give you a little story here about the history of Esau. And so part of the time of this transition, if you don't know, it was around the 1890s. The real Yahudim were being removed from Yash from Russia. So this was kind of one of those transition points. But here, let's get into the power of Esau and his eclipse of the empire of Jacob. Here is uh, the areas where the Nigerians are and where Edom is. And this is a particular uh, Edomite, Ayo, Ayuba or Suleiman, Solomon Diallo, or Job Solomon Diallo. And of course, Job, some speculate that he was actually an Edomite, a good man who was an Edomite. But this gentleman was a Muslim, and he captured and enslaved the Hebrews coming out of these areas in uh, Nigeria. And you can also see, here's another map of Edom. And this again is in the same region where we saw the map of Africa and the Hebrews. And this particular guy was an Arab Edomite slave stealer trader who was captured by the Yahudin after capturing a whole bunch of Hebrews and selling them into slavery. And then he was sold to the very trader he had just sold all the Hebrews to. And then he was taken to America. He begged him beforehand, the, the white slave trader, because they would sell to the Europeans. The Europeans could not handle the mosquitoes. They could not handle um, the malaria or the heat. So this is the work that the black Edomites did in Africa. And so he pleaded with the guy and he said, look, I just sold you a bunch of slaves, but his beard had been shaved off and his hair had been shaved off as well. So they said, he said, well, contact your people, send for them, and if they come get you, I'll free you. But he was sent to, an Amer to America, and then when he arrived there soon after, he was freed and sent back to, and celebrated and sent back to England. Of course, we know that King James and Queen Charlotte, uh, the Tudors, these were all people of Israel, people of the covenant, people of Britannia. And so this is what was overcome by the time the Rothschilds, Nathan Rothschild, came in. In 1790, less than three years after the Constitution had been signed, the money changers struck again. The newly appointed first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, proposed a bill to the Congress calling for a new privately owned central bank. Coincidentally, that was the very year that Amschel Rothschild made his pronouncement from his flagship bank in Frankfurt. Let me issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who writes the laws. Mayor Rothschild had five sons. He trained them all in the skills of money creation, then sent them out to the major capitals of Europe to open branch offices of the family banking business. His first son, Amschel Mayer, stayed in Frankfurt to mine the hometown bank. His second son, Solomon, was sent to Vienna. His third son, Nathan, was clearly the most clever. He was sent to London at age 21 in 1798, a hundred years after the founding of the Bank of England. But when Napoleon chased Prince William into exile, he sent 550,000 pounds a gigantic sum at that time, to Nathan Rothschild in London with instructions for him to buy consoles, British government bonds, also called government stock. But Rothschild used the money for his own purposes. With Napoleon on the loose, the opportunities of wartime investments were nearly limitless. William returned here sometime prior to the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. He summoned Rothschild and demanded his money back. The Rothschilds returned William's money with the interest the British consuls would have paid him had the investment actually been made. But the Rothschilds kept all the past profits they had made using William's money. Nathan Rothschild later bragged that in the 17 years he'd been in England, he'd increased his original 20,000 pound stake given to him by his father by 2,500 times. But now let's return to Napoleon. 
because nothing else in history more aptly demonstrates the ingenuity of the Rothschild family than their control of the British stock market after Waterloo. In March of 1815, Napoleon equipped an army which Britain's Duke of Wellington defeated less than 90 days later at Waterloo. Some writers claim Napoleon borrowed five million pounds from the Bank of England to rearm. But it appears these funds actually came from the Ouvard Banking House in Paris. Nevertheless, from about this point on, it was not unusual for privately controlled central banks to finance both sides in a war. Why would a central bank finance opposing sides in a war? Because war is the biggest debt generator of them all. A nation will borrow any amount for victory. The ultimate loser is loaned just enough to hold out the vain hope of victory, and the ultimate winner is given enough to win. Besides, such loans are usually conditioned upon the guarantee that the victor will honor the debts of the vanquished. This is the Waterloo battlefield about 200 miles northeast of Paris in what today is Belgium. Here Napoleon suffered his final defeat, but not before thousands of French and Englishmen gave their lives on a steamy summer day in July of 1815. Right over there, on June 18, 1815, 74,000 French troops met 67,000 troops from Britain and other European nations. The outcome was certainly in doubt. In fact, had Napoleon attacked a few hours earlier, he would probably have won the battle. But no matter who won or lost, back in London, Nathan Rothschild planned to use the opportunity to try to seize control over the British stock and bond market and possibly even the Bank of England. Rothschild stationed a trusted agent, a man named Rothworth, on the north side of the battlefield, closer to the English Channel. Once the battle had been decided, Rothworth took off for the Channel. He delivered the news to Nathan Rothschild a full 24 hours before Wellington's own courier. Rothschild hurried to the stock market and took up his usual position in front of an ancient pillar. All eyes were on him. The Rothschilds had a legendary communications network. If Wellington had been defeated and Napoleon was loose on the continent again, Britain's financial situation would become grave indeed. Rothschild looked saddened. He stood there motionless, eyes downcast. Then suddenly he began selling. Other nervous investors saw that Rothschild was selling. It could only mean one thing. Napoleon must have won, Wellington must have lost. The market plummeted. Soon everyone was selling their consoles, their British government bonds, and prices dropped sharply. But then Rothschild started secretly buying up the consoles through his agents for only a fraction of their worth hours before. Myths, legends, you say? One hundred years later, the New York Times ran a story which said that Nathan's grandson had attempted to secure a court order to suppress a book with this stock market story in it. The Rothschild family claimed the story was untrue and libelous, but the court denied the Rothschild's request and ordered the family to pay all court costs. What's even more interesting about this story is that some authors claim that the day after the Battle of Waterloo, in a matter of hours, Nathan Rothschild came to dominate not only the bond market, but the Bank of England as well. We see the light-skinned Nathan Rothschilds. He's often rendered as looking more white than this. These are more original paintings of him. You see, they had to use Esau Edom because Esau is the ruler of the world. He's the end of the world. And because Isaac put that blessing on him, even the fallen ones have to seek after Esau to run the world. So to get Britain, the land of Brachadashah, the land of the covenant, they had to send Esau in there to get it. And they gifted him 
Yah gifted him via the enemy to get it for the enemy and to get it for Esau to rule the world. And so now then we see these renderings of these Esarians mixed with the Ashkenazis and the uh, Europeans. If you see him in the center here looking very much like Esau, you see that is how they took over the world. And so they're trying to do the power flip again. So here um, we know everything's going back to black, as I said before, and so here we have representations. I keep showing this, but I just don't want you guys to forget it. So you can share, share, share. I put this knowledge out so you can share it with whoever is supposed to hear it. Hallelujah. Whoever's not supposed to hear it ain't going to hear it. And it's just a remnant. So we have all the Moorish dances in England and all over Western Europe. And this is why all of this happened to Tuadros in Ethiopia, because these people in England are the same people who are the Caliphate. Why is Queen Elizabeth bound to Haile Selassie? He does not look like any of the Ethiopian kings and rulers I've just shown you. He has a very different look to his face. He looks a bit more like an Edomite, a bit like the actor who played Salieri in Amadeus, the Italian actor with the more stony face, stony forehead, more light bulb type shaped head. So now the same thing is happening. And so this, the, the black Jews are now gonna take over and the black Muslims are going to take over. And this is a good example. This attorney gardener in St. Louis is always talking about black rights and uh, racism and that kind of thing now they she doesn't openly say she's jewish she's i i like i've always had jewish friends whether they were half black or white or whatever i can always recognize them she's jewish she's a black jew so um and and all the power to you because you know like you don't people we can't judge our brothers and sisters who are from who are edomites because we don't really know ultimately whose side they're on until we know they're, you know, we got to figure out whether or not they're on Yah's side or whatever. So we're not supposed to have hate or despise them. And I don't, I'm <laughs> just like, but I'm pointing out to you what is happening. And so this is what is happening. And it's going to happen on a global scale. It's going to happen with Africa. It's going to happen with everything when this abrupt flip tricks takes place. That's why it says at the end that Edom is judged at the end. It says Edom will be made to come and bow before your feet. But the thing is, is that Ashkenaz is Gentile. And so, like I said, that dream that I had in, in another one, and now they're really being exposed by everybody. Okay. So their, their time is going to end and Esau is gonna fully take over through the black identity now, or even mixed race with Ashkenaz uh, identity. You know what I mean? It's just, it's really interesting all the power dynamics and it's interesting what Yah reveals in dreams. Of course, we see she has this underbite that is so common among the Isarians. You really see it in King Philip and you see it in his forefather. The underbite. Gardener is usually a term applied uh, to, remember in my tree video, I talk about how they took the top branch and set, this is what Esau did, set it up in Babylon in his own garden, okay? So this is, this gardener woman is, is clearly um, Wishkenazi or Esarian and Wishkenazi. And so she is acting as a DA and she's pushing all the black causes, you know, against a lot of the persecution of the Hebrews. Of course, my favorite video that I love to show all the Islamists, the Muslims uh, in the land of Soyudan in Judea's, in Judah's land. Um, not all of them, of course, are practicing Muslims or anti-Shemitic. You know, it's going to be on an individual basis. But on larger political basis, we see the Pope bowing down to and kissing the feet of all of these leaders in the Sudan. And of course, if you noticed earlier, you can see the wife um, 
that he goes to kiss the feet of, she is wearing a outfit with the 666 on it. And you see everyone, you know, with the crosses on. Of course, this is the Asarian Four Corners. And if you notice, Meyer um, Roth, Amschel, uh, Rothschild, he had uh, four sons, one each for the four corners of the earth coming out of Europe. So you'll notice again here as he goes to acknowledge her she's got the 666 symbol integrated into her african garb you see it those six shapes in the yellow and brown batik on her clothing okay And of course, regarding Cyrus, there is this prophecy at the end of time of Yahuwah, you know, with the four carpenters raising up the spirit of the kings of the Medes for his devices against Babylon to destroy it because it is the vengeance of Yahuwah, the vengeance of his temple. And this is a vengeance against the body of the seed. Okay. So as I've said, there's been this big transition from um, uh, Negro to Bianco, and now it's going to be back from Blanco to Negro, Negro, and this has been facilitated by Esau. And, you know, we've just gone into all of that and how that also happened, you know, all throughout the four corners of the earth. And now when we come to the modern time, some of the ways in which it happened was through something called the Bandung Conference. All of the Muslims had decided to get together with the Chinese to basically ban dung, like in the 50s, I think it was, to uh, 50s and 60s in order to try to overcome the West. But it was too soon. And this is when the West really courted the Chinese and the Chinese became the um, Canaan began to serve Japheth. And so that whole uh, Eastern alliance was sabotaged by that and to this day so china has been serving uh the united states and is now serving russia and the eu so among them was uh those who went to this conference was nasir the famous egyptian president who said of israel you went away black and came back white and for this reason we can never accept you and of course, now we know that America is allied with Egypt, trying to fight against true Yasharel in Ethiopia. And then now the the Jews, the Jew, Ashkenazi Jewish people in Israel are flying home all these Ethiopians, probably the ones that are have allied themselves with America and Israel. And of course, of course, as well, the Somalians have with ordered that, uh, and Trump says he ordered withdrawal of U.S. troops from Somalia, but they kicked him out. They also kicked out the Kenyan ambassador. So there's all these global power plays going on. And so this is the U.N. positioning itself with these groups in Africa. And also some hidden information that you guys might not know about uh, was the relationship that Russia, of course, has with Israel. They're always presenting this hidden kind of we don't like you, Israel relationship. But of course, they're all related. They're all Gentiles. And Ashkenazi is on both sides. That Gog and Magog is not just gay, Gog and Magog. And so just take a look at this video. And we're going to see how the alliance between Russia, Israel, and the Arabs is shaping up. And of course, if you watch my last, my pre previous video to last about um, the fourth carpenter, uh, Africa, you can see how things are shaping up in East Africa in the land of Abraham with the black horse that rides forth from the south and so 
China and Russia are positioning themselves playing chess all through Africa to position themselves to take over from Babylon. And in my last video on the tree, we go into the Eagle Vision, which reviews that. Actually, we go into it in both videos. So take a look at my last two videos to check that out. Can you believe it? Saudi Arabia is set to play a key role in the development of a Russian COVID-19 vaccine that produced promising results in the first phase of human trials. The month-long trial on 38 people ended this week and a 100-person phase 2 trial is underway. Kirill Dmitriev, CEO of the Russian Direct Investment Fund, Russian Direct Investment Fund, said the kingdom will be part of phase 3 involving thousands of people. Why is this happening? When you hear Russia, think Israel. This is Israel. They're getting ready for what? Neon. Let's quickly cut to Israeli drones worldwide. I want you to watch this extract about Neon. This is video 10, COVID-19 kill switch, Israeli drones worldwide. I first released this video in March 2018. It got 60, 70,000 views. I took the channel down. I had to do my UN document long story. The one previous that had 250,000 views. Israeli drones worldwide. Let's watch briefly the section on Neom and cooperation between Israel and Saudi Arabia on Neom. The COVID vaccine is part of the Smart Cities program. The UN Habitat Smart Cities program. They're doing it in Egypt. They're doing it in Saudi. All right. And once they can get a formal peace deal between Saudi and Israel, just like they had between Jordan and uh, Egypt and Israel. That's what they're looking for. That's why Iran was brought into the region. That's why Henry Kissinger, um, his head of Kissinger and Associates, Paul Bremer, set Iraq on fire deliberately against the will of the American generals, who says, if you outlaw the Ba'ath Party and start locking everyone up, you will isolate the Sunnis and you will cause an insurgency and set Iraq on fire. And he said, fine, that's the plan. And they set it on fire. Iran's come in now. Russia's in and Saudi's pooing their pants. <laughs> and Israel's saying, hey, you need us, man. We've got to get rid of Iran out of the region. Russia will help. Are you getting it yet? Yeah. Let's quickly watch this section. The vaccine is all Israel. The UN Smart Cities technology, all Israel. The 5G, all Israel. Qualcomm now, 100 floors found in Qualcomm Snapdragon chips. Do you have a S10 Plus? 100 plus floors, Qualcomm, Erwin Jacobs, Israel, are you getting it yet? All right, let's dive in Israeli drones worldwide and go to this section. The Smart Cities program is being totally run by Israel and is a new cornerstone of their control mechanism. The Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman heir to the throne looks like one of those Gorbachev types that come along from time to time, an insider who thinks the regime in which he operates is wholly dysfunctional and needs to be reformed. One concrete ambition is investment of half a trillion dollars in a new futuristic city on the Red Sea coast called Neom. A place where pioneers and thinkers and doers can exchange ideas and get things done. The promotional video shows just how different they intend it to be from the stultifying repressed images we normally see from Saudi. Stunning nature, mountains, plains, valleys, coasts, coral reefs, islands, mountains are covered with snow in winter, mild weather in summer, 10 degrees less than the other Gulf cities. In so, and of course, like I said, we have all this positioning by Russia and China and the UN in Abraham's land east of the Nile with the Sudanese, uh, with Kenya being kicked out of Somalia's, with Kenya being kicked out as an ambassador in Somalia, with the American soldiers being removed from Somalia, with Ethiopia being supported by the Sudan, with the Ethiopian soldiers uh, being removed from the Sudan who are allying themselves against, or rather for the UN. So a lot of movements are going on, and we can see by the UN symbol that the UN symbol is the symbol of flat earth, and it is the symbol of this one world government. 
So Esau and the Europeans just do not want to give up the scepter and the fallen ones. But nonetheless, it's going to happen. But the beast will rule for one hour. So that will happen as well. And here's how they get into it. In the book of Jasher, we have a particular moment when Abraham is about to go and sacrifice Isaac. And he's taken with him Japheth and Ham. In other words, Eliezer and Ishmael. And they both know that he's about to sacrifice Isaac. So the two of them are arguing over who will get the inheritance. This is a bigger picture of what happens when Yasharel is abandoned by their rock, Yahuwah, for going after strange gods. And the two who are left to scramble over the garments of the firstborn son, over the inheritance, are Japheth and Ham. And of course, Ishmael and Esau were part of the transatlantic slave trade and the Arab slave trade. And of course, Eliezer, Japheth, eventually inherits the promise, dwells in the tents of Shem. But the interesting thing that we see in this picture, and, you know, Jasher does have inconsistencies in it, is that in verse 20, in book 23 of Jasher, it says, And Abraham went with Isaac toward the place that Elohim had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place at a distance which Elohim had told him of. And a pillar of fire appeared to him that reached from the earth to heaven and a cloud of glory upon the mountain. And the glory of Yahuwah was seen in the cloud. And Abraham said to Isaac, my son, do you see in that mountain, which we perceive at a distance, that which I see upon it? And Yatsik or Isaac answered and said unto his father, I see and lo, a pillar of fire and a cloud. And the glory of Yahuwah is seen upon the cloud. And Abraham knew his son, Yatsik or Isaac, was accepted before Yahuwah for a burnt offering. And Abraham said unto Eliezer and unto Ishmael, his son, Do you also see that which we see upon the mountain, which is at a distance? And they answered and said, We see nothing more, like, more than like the other mountains of the earth. And Abraham knew that they were not accepted before Yahuwah to go with them. And Abraham said also to them, Abide ye here with the ass, while I and Yatsek, my son, will go yonder mount and worship there before Yahuwah, and then return to you. And Eliezer and Ishmael remained in that place as Abraham commanded. So this is a picture of the difference between Israel and Japheth and Ham. So now we're going to transition over to Ham and what kind of a role through Ishmael and Esau Ham is going to play in these times. Because the Gentiles are going into slavery, into captivity, and Hasetan needs human sacrifices and slaves to power his kingdom. And so he's going to use Ham and the true Esau in his black form to make this happen because in this form he can also masquerade as Israel and Israel will be visibly empowered by having the light shine upon them. So this is the importance of this transition from Bianco black back to Negro and how Ham will now exploit Japheth through it via Esau. William Carr documented that Albert Pike wrote a letter to a friend in 1871 outlining the final and largest of the wars. According to Carr, what Albert Pike actually wrote was a lot more than a letter. It was a blueprint that spelled out exactly what would happen in the last war. Carr said, quote, 
In the 1860s, Albert Pike is recorded as saying his military program might take 100 years or a little longer to reach the day when those who direct the conspiracy at the top will crown their leader, King Despot, of the entire world and impose a Luciferian totalitarian dictatorship upon what is left of the human race. That's what they're saying. Pike seems to indicate a conspiracy to start a war so that the Antichrist can ascend to his position as world ruler. Pike's letter ironically also detailed the specifics of the first two wars with stunning accuracy, suggesting that he knew before time the details surrounding each of the wars. World War I, according to Pike, would be fought to overthrow the czars in Russia and change Russia into a communist state. The Second World War would be fought for two reasons, to establish the state of Israel and to expand communist control over Europe. The Third World War will be what allows the Novus Ordo Seclorum to rise out of the dust. According to Pike, Islam will be the central factor in the downfall of the West. Islam will be decimated in the process, allowing for the new religion of pure Luciferianism to spread on the earth. All Muslims will fall for this system. There isn't a single Muslim on earth who will not partake in the religion of the New World Order, according to Pike. Islam is merely a tool to destroy the Christian West. That's it. That's all it is. It's a tool. That's what they said hundreds of years ago. The master plan to use Islam was kicked off in 2001 when the fear of Americans was taken advantage of by an esoteric cabal lurking in the shadows. The storm that would come and the angel that would bring it were long awaited prophetic fulfillments. And as Albert Pike, grand wizard of the craft had predicted, Islam would be the choice religion to use to foment a crisis between it and the West that would only get worse. You can check my Black Horse Ride video again and my Goy videos for Ya'ob and his story of being a slave trader coming from amongst the Arabs, the descendants of Esau. And here's more information which came from Brother Duane from Hebrew Biblical Awakening. And this is from the history of Edom in West Africa. And it says here that the origin of the entire Fulanithine, the Fulbe or Fulani ethnicity comes from the geography, geographical area of Mount Sinai to Surs Tanakh. They thereafter persisted in migrating from place to place after they reached the lands of the far west and to the lands that Allah Ta'ala had willed for them to reach. This is positing of the Terube in the sacred mount where the Torah was originally revealed to Prophet Musa, Moses, provides them with the mechanism for organizing their collective experience around the Creator and infuses them with a divine purpose and destiny. This self-image will be played out repeatedly throughout the long history of the Turube in every region of Africa where they settled, and this concept will re-emerge again among the enslaved descendants of the Turube in the Americas as well, building on the Abrahamic line signification. Abdullah Dan Fuduye traces the Turube Aru'um, Rumi, Ru'um, was a descendant of both Hak Ishmael, the two sons of Abraham, consequently assuring for his ethnicity a complete fulfillment of the covenant given by the Creator to Abraham. Abdullah says, You also know that Arum is the son of Esau. Esau, the son of Esau. 
Eben is Hak Aben Ibrahim, upon him be peace. His mother was Nasmat, the daughter of Ish, Ma'ali Ibn Abraham, upon him be peace. Dahul Nasibin said in his Kitab Ta Tanwir, Ismael fathered twelve boys, one girl. It was from his descendants that the Arabs descended. Okay? When the death approached to be bequeathed to his brother, Ishaq, that his son Esau should be married to his daughter. So this is Ishmael marrying Ishmael's daughter marrying Esau. Okay? And from their marriage, Ar Arutum was born. Ar Ruum was yellowish in color, for which reason his children are called Banu al Asfar. It is interesting to note that Taru Bey traced their lineage to two sons whose birthright would have been in question, one being Islamiel, the firstborn of Abraham, and the African Nubian king Hagar, queen, or sorry, African Nubian woman Hagar. And the other was Esau, the grandson of Abraham, though his second-born son, Isaac. According to the Bible, Esau, the firstborn of Isaac, had his birthright taken by his younger brother, Jacob. Okay, so if you guys are understanding that, this is just proving that Ishmael had a daughter who married Esau, and Ishmael was the son of Abraham, and Esau was a son of Isaac, but the birthright belonged to Jacob, okay? And so these are the descendants of Abraham and Isaac who became the Arabs who enslaved Israel. Of course, Genesis Israel. 28, 8 and 9 says, Esau, seeing the daughters of Canaan, pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabahath, to be his wife. Okay, so there is the marriage in scripture. Now we read in this document here, if you look at the notations, it says Ruel down here had four sons and that Ruel was the son of Basemath, the daughter of Ishmael. Okay, so, so uh, but it says here, continuing um, from Waziri, Yohanid ibn Muhammad al-Bahari, drawing from earlier resources of the origin of Fulebi, combines them into a synthesis of opinion, he said, regarding their origin. It is said that the origin of the Turube are from the Jews, the Yahoos, the Yahudi. It is said they are from the Christians. It is said that they are from the Bambara among the Sudanese who came and settled between the Nile and Euphrates rivers. It is said that they are from the band of Banu Israel, that means sons of Israel, who relocated from the region of Sinai to the lands of Ta'ur. It is for this reason they are called Torudbi. Ta'ur is the land in the western part of Yemen and most sound opinion is that they are the descendants of Ru'um ibn Esau, so the son of Esau ibn Isharak ibn Ibrahim. Upon them be peace. They settled near the meeting of the two seas. Okay, so this is how we know that this is Esau and Ishmael and of course we know when Joseph was sold into slavery, it was the Ishmaelites who sold Joseph into slavery. So again, it's what has happened before will happen is again as it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the end. Yah speaks once and he says a thing twice, but people don't hear or understand. Hallelujah. So now here is where we get the connection to the black Muslims, because we know with 
the whole Ansaris movement, that's a conflict between the Israelites in the south and the Fulani Edomites in the north, and Buhari is ruling there. And uh, But also, if we go back to around the time of the Bang Dung Conference, we know that Malcolm X was around as well at that time. And Malcolm X really did not... I guess, defies all the stereotypes of current Islam, or in past Islam, actually. You know, I consider him to be one of the greatest prophets of the 400 years. And I actually drew this picture of him years and years ago, when I was in my 20s. And I, it's so funny, I just could never color in the part. You see where the star is for his ring? I just would not draw it. I risk, I don't know why I couldn't draw it. I wouldn't draw it. I just didn't draw it. And so you see it's just blank there in the photo. And I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't use this because I never finished it. And then I was like, wait a minute. Huh, I, I just always just stopped. I could not finish it. And so it really speaks volumes now because, of course, that's the Islam star. But Malcolm X was very clear in his, he eventually pursued Christianity as well. He was the one to state that we were Israel and he got into his trouble with Islam because he was outing Elijah Muhammad on his conduct with young underage women. And so again, it's the same issue. And so they constantly call him the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You don't have to say that with Malcolm X because Malcolm X is just good. He was he was good and he was a prophet. He was the first to speak to Martin Luther King and try to unify with him. And he was looking at Christianity. So he looked at Islam, Christianity, and he knew that we were Hebrew. And so he stood up and he protected black women, young women. He was a true man and a prophet. And he had, you know, a... a I think he was, he was a prophet of Yah, according to what was given at the time he was in. And I had uh, stated in a newspaper autumn about an effort to take my life back in January, and at that time the Muslims denied it. Why are they threatening your life? Well, uh, primarily because they're afraid that I will tell the real reason that they've been, that I'm out of the black Muslim movement, which I never told, I kept to myself. But the real, real reason is that Elijah Muhammad, the head of the movement, is the father of eight children by six different teenage girls. Six different teenage girls who were his private personal secretary. The one who first made me aware of this was Wallace Muhammad, Mr. Muhammad's son. And it was uh, their fear that uh, if I remained in the black Muslim movement, and this came into the knowledge of his followers that they would leave him and follow me. A plan immediately was set in motion to uh, take me down, put me out. And uh, the statement that I made about Kennedy was used as a, a pretext to take me down. Did you what get out of the will you take to protect yourself from this threat? I take no steps. I have a rifle. If anybody comes to my house, without a good reason. I, I intend to try and use it, uh, and that's all. We believe in the truth that is in the Bible, but we don't believe in the lies that the white man has put in the Bible. We believe in our prophets and the scriptures they brought to the people. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. We believe that the so-called Negroes are most in need of mental resurrection. Therefore, they will be resurrected first. We believe in the resurrection of the dead, what about the resurrection? He says that our people are dead. Negroes are dead. Walking zombies. You're the one that the book is talking about who is dead. Dead to the knowledge of yourself. Dead to the knowledge of your own people. Dead to the knowledge of your own God. Dead to the knowledge of the devil. Why, you don't even know who the devil is. You think the devil is someone down inside the ground that's going to burn you after you're dead. Why, the devil is right here on top of this earth. He got blue eyes. Blonde hair. White skin. And he's giving you hell every day. And you're still too dead to see it. We believe that the 20 million black people in America in the last day will be taught the truth. The trumpet of truth will sound in your ear. That is being sounded today. The trumpet of truth. And this truth strikes your ear and strikes your heart. It'll open your eyes. It'll open your ears. It'll make you stand up. It'll do the same thing for you that truth did for the dry bones in the 
valley. Because the picture of dry bones in the valley is talking about you. The picture of Lazarus laying dead four days is talking about you. You are Lazarus. You are the dry bones. You are the prodigal son. You are the lost sheep. You are the people about whom the Bible is speaking who will stand up in the last day when the trumpet is sounded. Black people are waking up. Black people are standing up. Black people are rising up and they're throwing fight into that knee-shaking white man. We believe we are the people of God's choice. That's what we believe. We believe we're the chosen people. We don't believe Jews are the chosen people. We don't believe Jews are the ones going to the promised land. We don't think Jews are a part of God. No, Jews are nothing but another part of that same race of devils that come out of Europe. They didn't even come out of the Holy Land. They come out of the caves of Europe. A Jew, a Frenchman, an Irishman, a devil. So what this article talks about with the history of the Eastern Star, the Order of the Eastern Star, it originated in Syria, but can also be found in Lebanon and Israel, etc. And it, the faith emerged during the 11th century from it, the Islamism branch of Shia and Islam, which combines aspects of Abrahamic religions, Gnosticism, Neoplatonianism, and other philosophies. So this is not what the descendants of uh, the Midianites are practicing. This is a different form of Islam tied to the Masons. Uh, and it says the early Druze faith was preached by Hamza ibn Ali ibn Ahmad, a Persian Islami scholar. And he, when he arrived in Egypt in 1014, he assembled a group of scholars and leaders from across the region to form this Unitarian movement. And it says that Druze are not a separate ethnic group, but a rather a religious and social group who has sometimes sim similarities to the predominantly Muslim-controlled nations they inhabit due to their secretive nature and some fundamental differences from the mainstream Islamic faith. So we see that there are, you know, we're not saying that all Islamists are like this, in particular the Midianites, but we're seeing the connection here between the Masons and Islam and how Albert Pike might potentially work with this. And of course, they always like to use women to promote these kinds of things and black women to hide everything under what I call the nigger pile, the nigger pile of everyone piles their issues on top of the Hebrew Israelites so that the Hebrew Israelites issues are never addressed. But all the issues of people piling their issues on top of the Hebrew Israelites are addressed. For example, LGBTQ. That's why you always have Black Lives Matter talking about LGBTQ. And this is why they aren't talking about Israel being the ones who were persecuted as the Moors in that particular identity. And then, and because even Vicki Diller did a video on, the, on that woman, Anne, whatever her name is, that white woman who goes around talking anti-slavery. She talked about the fact that Israel was enslaved through the Spanish Inquisition. And that's who they were before they came into slavery, but this is not mentioned on any of these channels by any of these spokeswomen. And I, I think it might be due to ignorance in some cases, but I do know uh, that there are some people who are, definitely would know because it's in videos they've talked about where they've got Gentiles talking about this, but they don't address it. So that is a key and a clue. And one of the stories relating to the persecution of Yasharel by Islam is this disgustingly disgusting red Shriner fez that they always wear. And they don't wear the turbans anymore. The reason why they wore the tur turbans was to usurp the identity of Israel as the Black Moors. Because the, the Islamist has to have his head closed to the heavens, closed to Yah. So he puts a fez or a cap on top. That's why the fake people in Israel do the same thing. If you wear a turban, you are exposing your head to the heavens to Yah. They put a pointy hat or a cap on their heads. Even when you see the caliphate's uh, hats, they're wearing pointy hats, or even when they're wearing a turban, they've got a pointy thing on top of it. They're covering their head, okay? And the story of the fez is that Masonic Shriners wear a red hat known as a fez, named after the town in Morocco where they in seven, or sorry, 980 AD, 50,000 Christians, including men and women, were brutally murdered by the Muslims as the streets ran red with the Christians' blood. And the fez symbolizes 
the slaughter of Christians in that town. And that among the oaths of the Masonic Shriner organization is one that says, may Allah, the God of Arab, Muslim, and Mohammedan, the God of our fathers, support me in the entire fulfillment of the same. So, um, and I rebuke that in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. So it derives its name from this. And of course, those people being massacred were Hebrews, not a bunch of white Christians, as you, as you might imagine in your head. So we have to be very clear about that. And of course, the key signal to the fact that Israel is not Kemet or, or Islam is, again, and this is just so obvious, Egypt enslaved Israel. And so did Islam. Islam ha Egypt has the worst record for enslaving Israel, and Islam has the worst record for enslaving Israel. A hundred million killed in the Islamic slave trade. And they were part of the transatlantic slave trade. And I've already gone into my videos, look at my Goy series, Bianco to Nero, and I go into all of that. So there is no way on earth any one of the transatlantic slave trade should be aligning themselves with anything Egyptian or Islamic. All right, that's the most obvious one. If you want to get an A on your exam, who enslaved you? The Gentiles, the Egyptians, and Islam. Okay, so it's not about race. It's not black and white. It's about Israel. Now, because the women of Yasharel are currently the lions operating as the males in the upside down world, remember the scripture talks about how Yah and the, ch the church was the upside down church. Everything was going to be turned upside down. The first were going to be last, the last were going to be first. So Satan and all his angels are now up and Israel is down. Satan is the head, Israel is the tail. It's the upside down church that the Apostle Paul talked about to make Israel jealous. Isaiah 24 says, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty and maketh it, it, it a waste and turneth it upside down and scatter abroad the inhabitants thereof. So this is the upside down church. That's what Isaiah says, Acts 17, 6. But they did not find them. They dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These are they who have turned the world upside down and they have come here too. So this is the reversing of everything. And this is, you know, a lot of sisters complain, why do I have to be the man? Why do I have to be the man and be standing out and be talking about this, what the brothers are doing wrong? Why aren't the brothers protecting the women? And this is the nature of the upside down world that either the brothers don't protect or a satanic brother will not be protecting children and women. They'll actually go after them like they're men and they'll threaten and abuse them. And consequently, instead of the men ruling in Israel, the women are ruling in Israel. The women have the lion's mane of the man, of the male lion. So this is why so many women speak out and teach. And instead of the men ruling in Israel, the women are ruling in Israel, okay? The women have the lion's mane, okay, of the man. You notice that when the awakening really started, right after uh, that video, Good Hair, came out, uh, I, that Chris Rock did, all of the sisters started growing their hair natural. That was the beginning of the end. Because the sisters grew up the lion's mane and got in touch with the heavens, like a tree, right? This is the tree again, guys. You got to watch my tree video. It looks like it's not so important, but it's very important, okay? So yeah, this is the women with the lion's mane, the women ruling. And this, we all complain about it. We don't like it. It manifests itself everywhere. Of course, the men of Yasharel are in proper order and doing that more and more and more. But still, as we are in this captivity, everything's upside down. So we have women teachers and so you see that, or prophets, or speakers, or leaders. This is no, not always in unrighteousness, because remember, Judith, Deborah, Jael, the female prophets, many of them were positioned to lead when the men fell, when the men were weak. And this is why it says there's, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor fia, female in Yahushua HaMashiach. But still, legally, this is an upside-down situation, okay? 
So really this, what the men should be doing is leading like this. The women can do it also, but we're also the fallback plan. And when women are misleading the nation and misleading men and lording things over men, then that is outside of the order as well. Okay. But when the men can't do it, Yah has made it so that the women do it in their place to help things set things right again. That's why she is his help mate. Okay. So it's not always out of order. All right. But when it's being doing, done unrighteously or it's being done outside of Yasharel or Hamashiach, then it's out of order. But when it's being done in righteousness and correctly, it is in order for moving the nation forwards of Yasharel. Okay. I don't want any of you to be confused about that. And so you see the Muslim movement, you see the Gentiles have always used that. That's why there's, as I've said, there's always been a black woman in the white house. She was set up in the white house as that male head, but that authority of the white male and the upside down world was put on her to rule over her. Okay. So what the Muslim faith uh, does is they will take, or Kemet will take, also will take females and they'll use Black women as, as uh, operatives working in witchcraft as well, okay, to fight and war against their own people. Or they'll use black women uh, in the Democratic Party. You know, Trump had Omarosa, now there's Candace Owens. And in the Democratic Party, they have all these black women who are operating, you know, bodyguarding, body checking, you know. <laughs> people in, you know, who are, who are going to say anything against the Democrats. So this is how the strength of black women is abused in this upside down world, this upside down system. So they take what they, the upside down system does is it now takes these women and tries to use them against us. And even within the alternative culture and particularly among the Muslim women. And of course, Satan, what mixes truth with a lie. And so what happens is that we have Muslim or Kemet faiths mixing 90, it'll go right to 99% truth if they have to, because they're in deep warfare. And of course the Muslims are the Sabaeans who the Gentiles will eventually be sold to. So you see the Muslims really warring for that black identity, for everyone to stay within the black identity so that they can uh, perpetuate the power structure that exists under Esau. And when it switches from Gentile to back to Yasharel, they want to take it over with the black Muslims. And eventually when Israel is freed, they will sell the, some of the Gentiles to the Sabaeans. And that's who the Muslims really are. Okay. So, but this is how black women are being used outside of Israel within the established system or through the Muslim faith against our people. So this is how the Muslims use women to power the pedophile agenda. Okay. Because, and this is why there's all this discussion of angels. Why the worship of angels, the worship of angels, because when the angels fall, they're going to need pedophilia. Because as I've told you before in my other videos, it's the shedding of innocent blood. And that's what they require to eat. That's why they're associated with vampires and human sacrifice. And so the worship of angels and familiarizing yourself with angels will cause you to worship them and make you okay with pedophilia and human sacrifice. Because that is how the false religions of Kemet and Egypt are powered because their power is not from heaven. Their power is coming from you. Okay. Because you're seated in heavenly places and literally the Hebrews are truly being seated and unseating the fallen, as I've already said. So this is how the women of Islam are being used to serve the fallen ones in the upside down world. File item 49, SC 145, the clerk will read. Senate Bill 145 by Senator Weiner and Accolade and Sex Offenders. Ms. Conlogger, you are recognized. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I rise to present Senate Bill 145, which will end California's highly discriminatory treatment of specific sex acts by our state's sex offender registry law by giving courts discretion over all cases of voluntary intercourse between teenagers and young adults. Under current law, if a young person has voluntary sexual intercourse with a minor aged 14 through 17 and is no more than 10 years older than the minor, the offense is not automatically registrable. However, the court has discretion based on the facts of the case to decide whether or not to place the defendant on the sex offender registry. Statutory uh, rape should be a registrable offense either way. And by lowering this offense, colleagues, uh, we are signaling to families and the children everywhere that uh, we support these uh, abusive uh, situations. If you look at the uh, summary of this bill, it provides that uh, the persons of, uh, convicted of uh, sodomy, oral copulation, or sex penetration by foreign object under specified provisions of uh, law would not be required to register as a sex offenders if uh, at the time of uh, offense the person is uh, not more than 10 years older than the minor and the conviction is uh, only one requiring the person to register. I mean, this is uh, unbelievable. What kind of a bill is this? Uh, what kind of a law so are we trying to enact uh, by this body. This is uh, intolerable. If you want to know why this Democratic Assembly member is going so hard for this bill, being an African-American woman, is because she's a Zeta, a Order of the Eastern Star, a Prince Hall Freemason is why. One of the few Canaanites who made it in to the midst of the Hebrews and made it into the Promised Land was descendant of Yephunneh, Caleb the spy in Numbers 13, 6. And he was considered to be of Judah, but his father was Yephunneth, a Canaanite. And this is where I suspect the African-American saying, you're funny looking. You don't look like us, comes from. This is only a guess, but you have to remember Esau looks a lot like Jacob. Okay? And when you look into Jubilees, you find that when warring with the Amorites, ultimately, just like as the Hebrew women today are wearing the lion's mane in captivity, so also the other nations send forth their women to war just like because they've run out of their males or because the male empire is falling. And so these are the women of Esau warring. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot is of the Order of the Eastern Star. And you can see the similarity in the features with the Fulanis. Also DJ Switch in Nigeria. Yeah, fun it. Funny looking. Looks like she's Fulani. But I learned her name is Catherine Obianuju Ude, which is an Igbo name. So very likely she's Recently just it was another rumored that she's Toronto getting a visa Israel. to come to Canada. You see here, she has directed people to protest. She was the leader of the protests where people were massacred at First off, I'm doing okay. the Lecky Tollgate Massacre. I hope you all are doing all right. Hmm? All right. So uh, I've been offline for a while. Um, I logged on yesterday. I brought myself up to speed with regards to news, or as much of it as I could, and what's happening. From Lecky to Obibo. Ironically, rapper DJ Switch looks more Fulani than she does Ebo. And as well... Her name is Switch. Remember I was talking about the switch, the reset, the global power flip, turning the world right side up again. 
And so her, she's a DJ. She's very masculinized. And of course she has all the hand signs here. And she looks very much like the previous women we saw who are from the Fulani tribe. And to places we've never heard of or about. And it is gut-wrenching, to say the very least. So I want to share a few things with you guys, okay? First of all, I know the fight that we're fighting, it is not a fair fight. It is not a fair fight by a long shot. We're up against people that have all the power, that have all the money, resources, access. They control all the security arms. Corruption is... Is the order of the day. Lies on top of lies on top of lies. Lie. Not kill Mohammed. Short term option. We go out there. Oh, screaming at the top of our voices. Demanding change. We want our country back. Standing on our constitutional rights. And knowing the government we have. They might just waste all of us away. The end. The second long term option. We do nothing. We still die. Maybe one by one, but we still die off. Either from poverty, a very poor health sector, security personnel. Take the newspaper boy that was selling his newspaper by the side of the road. And a security personnel of a speaker shot him, side of the road, trying to earn his living. Dead. For what? He said in the beginning, these people have all the power, money, resources, access. It is only one power we have. And our power is just, our power is right. It is our voice. Our voice. And we must use it in whatever capacity that we can. We must use our voice. This is how I see it. It's like a key that opened a door to a big warehouse. Hmm? Palliative gang, come through. And in that warehouse is all the problems plaguing Nigeria. In very indirect ways, we have uh, an Islamist, for example, like Vicki Dillard, who associates herself with the, the Islamists, although she says she has no formal association with them. I want to be very careful about what I say here. I do not recommend it unless somebody is completely out of the faith and they need to be deprogrammed or they're completely secure in the word of Yah and they know they're Yahshua, okay? Uh, but I do li have listened to Vicki Dillard sometimes. I also, as, as I've said before, there's other women that I listen to who are not Hebrews. Now, she has amazing teaching. She's got, she did the teaching on uh, the women of how the white women were basically slave owners. She brought all that up, did amazing videos on it. She talked about how the land in New York was usurped from black people. She really doesn't use labels. She says, don't use labels because it's a way of trapping you in the Hegelian dialectic and the, and I don't really listen to her anymore. But so she is a great deprogrammer of white supremacy and she's, very good at explaining how it operates. And so if you're trying to help someone deep, she's great for deprogramming people and to pointing people, for pointing people to educational resources. Not so much now, now she kind of, and she can be super funny. And so I've really enjoyed her stuff, but nonetheless, she's coming from this Islamist perspective. And I've even sent her stuff, like I've sent her my calendar. I think I might've sent her my cookbook too, because she has an autoimmune illness like me. And she's had people attack her about that, which is terrible. I, I'm not trying to put her down, but I'm talking about the doctrine, the Islamist in doctrine that she is in and standpoint that she is speaking from, from a perspective of Islam. My hope is that she will get saved and come into Yasharel. My prayer is that she has not done anything and nothing has been done to her to prevent that because I tell you, I've really enjoyed some of her stuff, but I can't formally recommend her to you as a Hebrew because some people just can't deal with other doctrines and not fall off into darkness. Okay. So I cannot recommend her as a Hebrew, but I'm a watch woman. I study media 
And even I can get seduced by these things a little bit. Like, I love, I'm like, oh, I love her. She's just like, she makes me, you'll see commentary. I'm in there sometimes and she, and she just makes me laugh and laugh and laugh. So she's a great teacher for deprogramming from slavery. Same with this Mishi woman. They're both, you know, absolutely amazing for deprogramming the mind, deprogramming from, programming from slavery, teaching the real history, okay, of the diaspora. But they don't talk about the Spanish Inquisition at all. That's kind of curious. So she appeals to people as a Christian or a Hebrew, but she defers to the Muslims and the Muslim faith. Same with Grandmaster Jay. He was very careful to go out and introduce the fact that the KKK had enslaved the children of Israel, but he just used that as a hook to speak to all these Israelites about, you know, being part of his gun group. And, and again, I, I just don't think that there's any intelligent Hebrew who would ever come up with the word, with an, an acronym like NFAC, no effing around. Like it's just, it's something right out of a Hollywood script or movie. It's just very cheesy. And, and even, it's like he's a character from a Hollywood movie that a Wishkenazi Edomite would come up with in a script. It's just so poorly representative of, you know, even the name Black Panther is co-opted, like it's Black Panther 2. You know, it's like not even like Black, Jacob is the former of all things. And so when Jacob comes up with something, even if he's in the hood, in the ghetto, which this guy is not, it's going to be good. So anyway, all of that to say that both of them are drawing people to the black color thing, the not Israel thing, but yet talking about Israel. And so she has a lot of brilliant analysis and deprogramming and stuff. Uh, but she is used to a degree like most women in is Islam for, um, you know, a lot of good functions, but also a very negative one to my eyes. One of the things that Vicki Dillard does is she, she points, would point out somebody like Donald Trump and she would say, well, look, he's, he's an alleged rapist and look at all these questionable photos with his daughter. And of course, you know me, I'm not into any politicians. And this is one of the things I love about her. She's like no labels, no sides. Uh, Vicki Dillard avoids all dichotomies. Okay. But the one she doesn't avoid is black and white. She says it's about race. We invite anybody, whether you're in witchcraft, whether you're Islam, whether you're whatever your spirituality, Christian, whatever she hears and invites everybody in. Same with NFAC. And so that's how you know that it is not of Yah, because he sets apart. He's not for unity and certainly not in race because black and white, what are those? Those are the colors of Satan's world, the black and white checkerboard. And so now the only dichotomy she holds on to is the black and white race dichotomy. So you're still in a dichotomy. It's still the two headed eagle of Esau, right? That's how you can recognize it. So, she still says black and white, and those are two different labels, okay? Because the Gentiles will cling to Israel. So this is about Yasharal saving a lot of people from different nations and those people clinging to them. So it's not exclusively about black and white. It's about the spirit, the children of Yasharal and the grafted in. And that is the difference. What she'll say about Trump is that she'll say, well, he's an alleged rapist and he's alleged pedophile. He's hanging out with Jeffrey Epstein and look at these questionable photos with his daughter. But she, And then she says at the same time, but all these white women have voted for him because they're so loyal. In fact, even more of them have voted for him despite those things. And the implication is that hmm, the black community should do the same for their pedophiles. And so in the case of somebody like R. Kelly or, for example, Bill Cosby or Michael Jackson, the position is, oh, you know, um, these guys, we just need to handle them ourselves within our community. And they aren't questioned, challenged, or judged with respect to how black men, especially the Muslim community, treats women and girls, girls, children, this children, adolescents. And so uh, that becomes a problem, especially when we have evidence that R. Kelly knew that 
how old Aaliyah was. She was 14, and apparently that his doc he forged the, the documents to marry her. So, and of course, the same thing goes also for Grandmaster Jay. Grandmaster Jay has said openly that he doesn't mind people with a pedophile charge joining his military as long as they have his back. I don't know how he can say that. If you don't have a child's back, you can't have an adult's back. Do you know what I mean? How could you? So, um, so these are the things that people aren't really paying attention to. And the, in turn, and so we're looking here at Kemet and we're looking at Islam and we see it always ends up in pedophilia because they're satanic religions that you're dealing with fallen angels. They're always feeding off of children and they're always, it's human sacrifice and pedophilia. Now the leader of NFAC himself Grandmaster Jay is very questionable because he's been seen in videos running security for Trump. And he was once with Black Lives Matter. He says all of this was in the context of running for government. I don't know how that's relevant um, because when you see the video, it is very questionable. It looks like he's supporting Trump and he's, it's, he's doing some kind of a security role. Um, also, recently the Black Lives Matter one of the leaders went into the protection of NFAC and it just seemed very staged and dramatic and everything. KJ Brooks is literally LGBTQ. And so this is again, it's always Black Lives Matter is, al is always doing this. And so it seems very staged, very contrived. So, but he himself has stated and he takes very much a comedic point of view in his spirituality. He, of course, started off by going to this rock in the, in the southern United States and saying that the KKK had taken the children of Israel captive and they were going to pay for it. But all of his teaching, 90% of it really, is around Kemet. And when he was addressing the, um, some of his, the people who were taking part in joining NFAC, he said that he didn't discriminate against pedophiles at all, as long as they have his back. Now, I didn't download that video because I was like, oh, I don't want to get in the Trump controversy, but it was in the summer and he did say that. And so um, if anyone can find it, uh, I tried to find it again and I couldn't, but that is what he said. And so I don't know why anyone would trust somebody that you can't trust with children's safety. I don't know why anyone would trust their safety to someone who, whom you can't trust with children. But that aside, uh, we do have one challenger to these, these ideas. And that of course is, I think it's Mishi X. I don't really watch these people a lot, but she does speak out against pedophilia and she speaks out against LGBTQ. And of course, this has, she's been very much attacked by people like Tariq Nasheed. I don't know if this is all just, there's so much distraction going on right now. I don't know if this is just two camps that were set up to fight together um, as part of this black power uh, exchange and usurping of the positions of the Hebrews. But nonetheless, uh, it's, it's what is happening. And so... Um, Michi X does question all of this kind of behavior and she's actually had, you know, threats against her and her son who's in prison by uh, people who follow Tariq Nasheed. This is what she says on her channel, alleged threats, and it really paints an ugly picture as, of the Muslims. And so but the, all of this to say that this is how this agenda is being promoted because when you're dealing with Kemet, when you're dealing with Islam, when you're dealing with anything but Israel and the children of Israel, and yeah, you are dealing with a satanic religion. And so, you know, I'm not saying these things to insult those women. It's just a fact and a reality of, of what it is that they're talking about. And I really encourage you to pray for Mishi X. She does a lot of swearing and cursing. And uh, when she's talking, but she is extremely bright, has excellent analysis, but she just curses like a sailor. But um, 
I just encourage you to pray for her because she doesn't believe in any creator whatsoever, whatsoever. And she, but she does understand that we're in a power structure. So I'm not saying that Michi is Kemet or she's in agreement with pedophilia or anything like that. She speaks out very much against it and has done a lot of great analysis about it. And same with Vicki Dillard about um, rape, sodomy, pedophilia and all that stuff during slavery even currently, but she just does not call black people out on it. And it seems that Michi is in a position where she needs protection. And so that's why she's now associating with uh, Grandmaster Jay. And she's flying all over the place, traveling and stuff. I guess she does a lot of work in the black community. I don't really know a lot about it, but I'm just saying these are the voices we're hearing. And I'm not saying that she's aligned herself with a satanic point of view or anything like that. I'm just saying that's kind of the world she's in and, and how she's getting positioned because she's speaking out against Islam. She, she is speaking out against the sexism towards women because it is very real and the pedophilia. And so that's putting her under attack. And then Vicki Dillard is in a difficult situation too. And it seems like, um, I mean, she X has really says, said some terrible things about her because Vicki Dillard has, you know, health issues and regarding that and there's other things that are just their politics of you know what's going on with the platforms they were on and that kind of thing but um nonetheless i i don't think that mishi at this point is being used uh well is having this chemic point of view or anything but you can see how these things are sh shaped up in order to push this um non-Hebrew point of view. So the other thing that Diller does is she does always flash the 666 sign and she is talking about, as I said already, angels. She lives in Colorado. You know, that's where so many alien sightings were. And of course, if you didn't know, the first thing I ever learned when I came into the truth was that the aliens are fallen angels. So she's out there in Denver and that's where you're going to be sighting a lot of angels or UFOs and that kind of thing. And she does always teach about angels on the Shabbat. So she doesn't do it on a Sunday. It's always on the Shabbat. Now I can't say she's fully aware of all of this, but it's a bit problematic. And she's also in the wonderful world of Denver, Colorado, which is where they have this crazy weird airport and they've got supposedly this underground city of the fallen and their offspring and you know, all this sort of weirdness going on. And then the obelisks have been, been appearing. And the Hellier, the Canadian government, the fake Israelites are all saying that it, they've made contact with the aliens. And so it's all just this setup for this new world order and for us to contact the aliens as the creators. And so that is a great concern. And of course, Colorado is on severe lockdown and has been for months. Like you can't go to government buildings to get your paperwork. You've, they've got curfews. Everybody is locked in and on lockdown. So that's really telling you something because there's so many UFO sightings there all the time. But anyway, so my prayer is that, you know, both of these sisters come to see who they truly are. And there's certainly a precedence that I've talked about in my videos for the people of Islam, the women of Islam and the people of Islam to know exactly who we are. So it's completely possible for her to make that bridge. Uh, and I pray and hope that she will, that both of them will actually. So the Quran actually states in Surah, 247 ayat, O ye children of Israel, call to mind the special favor that I bestow upon you and fulfill your covenant to me, with me, as I fulfill my covenant with you, and you shall all fear none other than me, for I am Yah. So this is in the Quran. So they, they know who Israel is, and they know the promises to Israel. I've already talked about the fact that the Midianites were descendants of Keturah, and they are also in Islam, and they may also be connected to the Magi, okay? So they know who Israel is. 
They truly know who Israel is. That's Sephora, Jethro, and as you've seen in my previous videos, you will see them in Mecca now and in Arabia still. But here's another scripture in the Quran that speaks to who Israel is. 2194 to 97. This is the day that we shall roll up the heavens like the rolling up of the written scrolls by a scribe. Yet as we began the first creation, we shall reproduce it. This is a promise binding upon us. We will do it as we have already written in the Zabor that is in the book of Psalms, the book of David, having already stated it. The reminder that HaTorah, after the previous mention, that my righteous servants written within it with right capacity to rule shall inherit the land of paradise. And so this is again referring to Yasharel. And so there is a precedence for returning to the truth if you are in Islam with this kind of scripture. And of course, we saw Malcolm X, the greatest prophet of the transatlantic slave trade, actually do that, protect women, be a faithful husband, seek after the wellness of the people and their return to their God. And so it is completely possible for the Islamists to move back to Yah. So when we see images like this, these kinds of alliances taking place, this is ultimately the Pope, this notion of unity, unity amongst people or race or in whatever dichotomy is always about Hasetan. And so this is where you're being led by these doctrines. And these, of course, are the Sabaeans to whom the Gentiles will be sold with this new world order taking shape. And because... Esau and the Europeans stole Western Europe from Shem and from Abraham, then that is land that they're going to have to leave. I believe the scripture talks about their land in Genesis being the Isles of the Sea. So some of the islands might belong to them, possibly like around Greece, Greece and the Iran and the Medo-Persian areas, but the rest of it seems to be Shem's land. So they're gonna have to leave there. They're gonna have to leave Western Europe. That's why they're always saying, oh, I'm Scottish and I'm English and I'm Irish. And, I'm, and they go into great detail and I'm German. And well, I think all those lands, like especially the Danube, Dan's river, I think all of those lands are Shem's land and they're gonna have to get out. So once again, family, this is the story of the great oak Nebuchadnezzar that has been ruling the world. And that has also been through the Gentiles. So, so the job of the Gentiles is to pay what you owe and to let my people go and return also the scepter of Damascus. And we have fake Israel allying with the 10 kings and Arabia and Gog and Magog, Putin, Russia, and China. So these are the Canaanites. This is Gog and Magog, the Philistines, the Amorites. All of them are setting up in Abraham's land and Israel to basically try to fight against this directive from Yah. But his will is what will be done. So that's everything that is lining up right now. And Putin's got his pieces on the Africa chessboard to set everything in motion. And so that means um, that as the winter comes, they're going to try to push all of their stuff, including the vax. And of course, one of the reasons why they're doing that is because they know all the plagues are coming. And I think actually, Satan is trying to not only to kill off the children of Israel, but also to protect his own children with all these masks and everything for the coming plagues that Yah has. And also for the angels opening up the fallen ones and coming to this land because it's for them to inhabit this place is going to be pretty funky and polluted because they live basically off defilement. And so do their offspring, the ones who are in the underworlds and the underground cities. So Anyway, um, 
I want to end on a high note. So I'm going to just go into the story of how I did my video with the song and see if the song encourages you guys. That's what it's there for. Most of all, it's to praise Yah. And so don't judge me too harshly because, you know, I'm not a perfect singer and this isn't a perfect recording. There's some mistakes and stuff, but you'll get the gist of it. And then I'm just going to work on trying to record it. It's not perfectly recorded, but I just wanted you guys to know that I was able to do this in the Ruach. I'm just excited about it. So anyway, here we go. So Salama family, this is the song I am not going to sing it live because I don't really know it yet. And it's... This is the Passover song, Moses' Passover song. That's what was said to me in the dream when I was told to instruct people to sing it. And I want to tell you right now that we're having other people working on the song. Okay, so we're going to be translating all the way into Hebrew. Um, I wanted to let you know that so it will evolve and change, but this is what it is to begin with because at first, yeah, I was like, have it all in Hebrew. Actually, it was more like build the music from the Hebrew, not English or any other language. And so the verses and the chorus and all that kind of thing had to start with the Hebrew. You will note that there are no Ishmaelites counted among the enemies who were destroyed. Why? Because Esau is the enemy of Israel. Okay, Esau is the enemy of Israel. And I was rehearsing it with one of the elders, just doing psalms. We sing psalms together. It's kind of how he instructs me. And I was like, oh, I was like, the Ruach was kind of like, no, nah, this isn't going to work. It's going to be hard because you have to teach our people the language through the song. And it's a long song. So the way that I learned in choir about songs was that you do learn Hebrew as you sing in verses. And so when Yah gave me this song, then... I, he started giving me some of that and I started looking for some of that. So it's been a really evolving process where I just am following the Ruach and seeing what the Ruach does. So um, he kind of gave me two songs or three songs. He's been giving me a lot of songs and I just don't write them down because I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to teach. I want to teach. But it's like, he's giving me songs for a reason, I guess. He's given me songs since 2013. So for about seven years now. So um, I guess this is the culmination. Like I've never really written them, written them. They were just choruses and stuff. And so this is my first time writing a song. So please don't judge me too harshly. I'm not a professional singer. I don't sing. You know, like you African-Americans like people to sing. She can sing, but she can't sing. Which is something, of course, that the music industry invented to keep everyone from praising Yah and only certain people could and then they had to praise Satan with that voice. So just keep that in mind. Everyone, all the Hebrews have a singing voice, love to dance, love music, all of that kind of thing because we're the priests of the earth. So don't judge me on saying it. Um, so anyway, let's, let's get into it. So I've set you as a seal upon my heart, for there is love that's stronger than death. There is jealousy more persistent than the grave, and yeah, won't rest till he redeems. Yasharel and many waters cannot quench his love. Sir Yahuwah, go ah, go ah, Suez Raka Ramayim. Sir Yahuwah, go ah, Ramhu, Suez Raka Ramayim. Sing glory, glory to Yahuwah, horse and rider he cast in the sea. Sing glory, glory to Yahuwah, horse and rider he cast in the sea. Yahuwah, my song and strength, my salvation, my Elohim, with him right as a way he Yeshua, 
of Ellie. I will prepare him a habitation, my father's Elohim. Elohim, I will praise him, Abba. I will exalt him. Yo, who was a man of war? Yahuwah is his name. Elohim we an we hu abba aromem hu. Yahuwah sabo oh. Milha mahashem. Pharaoh's chariots and hosts, Yah, has cast into the sea. Pharaoh's chariots and captains are drowned in the sea. The Red Sea depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom as a stone. Glorious in power, Yahuwah's right hand. Those who rose against you, he is overthrown. By the excellence of your greatness, you dance down the enemy like stones. Yeshua, a man, a Tesla, Gamaka, Taharos. Gorika, Ubaraka, Gas, Hanukkah, Ra'as, oh yeah. Yeshua, glorious, your right hand sent forth those who rose against you. He has overthrown by the excellence of your greatness, like stubble your wrath has consumed. Yeshua, Amenika, Tesla, Gamaka, Taharos. Kyorika, Uberabha, Gas, Hanika, Yoke. You see, Yahua, go ago, ah, Suez, Rakam, Ramayan. You see, Yahua, go ago, ah, Suez, Rakam, Ramayan. Sing glory, glory to Yahua, horse and rider, he's cast in the sea. Sing glory, glory, hallelujah, horse and rider he cast in the sea. And by the blast of your nostrils like a heap, the waters stood upright. The waters gathered upright in the sea. The heart of the depths congealed the floods, and I will overtake. Pursue and take the spoil and satisfy my lust against thee. I will draw my sword with my own hand, I will destroy Kite bear of the enemy. But by Yah's mighty wind, like let they sink into the seas, pursue, cover them. Bury them into the mine. Who is like you, O oh, Yahuwah, amongst all the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise? Who is like you, Yahuwah, doing wonders, and we worship you with awe? You stretched out your right hand, Yeshua, and the earth swallowed them up. Now in thy mercy has led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength to the house of the rock of the Shemayim. Yesiria hua go'a go'a. Suez Rakam Ramayim. Seir Yahua Arama Menhu. Suez Raka Ramayim. Sing glory, glory to Yahuwah. Horse and rider, he's cast into the sea. Sing glory, glory to Yahuwah. Horse and rider, he cast into the sea. Yeshua, glorious, your right hand sent forth. Those who rose against you, he is overthrown. 
by the excellence of your greatness, like stubble your wrath has consumed. Yeshua, Emanika, Tesla, Gamaka, Taharos. Gyorika, Uberab, Kagas, Hanika, Yoke, Lamo. The nations shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold of the Philistine, and the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling seas, and cannot melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine art, they shall be still as a stone. Till thy people pass over, Yahuwah, till thy people pass over, which you've redeemed. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mount of thine inheritance. In the place, O oh Yahuwah, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in. In the sanctuary, O oh Yah which thy hands have established. And Yahuwah shall reign forever and ever. You see Yahuwah, go a go a, Suez Raka Ramayim. Sing glory, glory to Yahuwah, horse, rider, chariot covered by the sea. Sing glory, glory to Yahuwah, horse, rider, chariot covered by the sea. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. Yes, the children of Yasharel walked dry shot in the midst of the sea. And prophetess Miriam, sister of Aaron, took timbrel in Hananan's house. And the women of Yasharel took timbrel and danced out after Miriam. Yes, Yasharel women took timbrel and danced out after her Miriam. Yesir Yahuwah, go a go a, Suez Rakam Ramayim. Yesir Yahuwah, Ra'amem Hu, Suez Raka Ramayim, sing glory, sing glory, glory to Yahuwah, horse and rider he cast in the sea. Sing glory, glory to Yahuwah, horse and rider he cast in the sea. Yeshua, Amanika, Tesla, Gamaka, Taha, Rose. Yorika Ubaraka Gas Hanaka Yoke Lamo. I've set you as a seal upon my heart. There is love that's strong, stronger than death. There is jealousy more persistent than the grave. And Yahweh rest till he redeems Yasharel and many waters cannot quench his shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling seas and Canaan melt away. In the waters of the Mayim, I've set you as a seal, a seal upon my heart. And there is love Strong, stronger than death. There is jealousy more persistent 
than the grave. And the one rest of he redeems Yashar Ali and many waters cannot quench his love. No many waters cannot quench his love. Hallelujah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so that's a, that's a song. I messed up a kind of a couple times there, but that's okay because it's you know it's for ya and it's for you guys and for you guys to also know that you can sing and write songs too because that's what you're supposed to do as a king and priest. Praise ya! So I hope I haven't like scared anybody too much. <laughs> but that's the song he gave me. He's so awesome. <laughs> Like, I mean, I can't even believe, like, the stuff he gives me, the good gifts he gives me. And it's like today, family, I had such a struggle with work with, you know, I just want you guys to know, I don't think I'm perfect. He doesn't just give me gifts because he thinks I'm perfect. He's just good. This is nothing to do with me. So, um, yeah, I had some struggles with work today and he was trying to bring me up a little higher and I failed. But I can praise him with this song. And we know as we head into these times of darkness, family, that the dark winter, so they call it. But what does the word of Yah say about that? It says that his bright, his darkest dark is bright like the noonday sun. That's what the word says. So remember that, family. And we're supposed to sing. This is now the key time to praise, the key time to war, and especially now, you know, they're talking about the aliens coming out and they're talking about like the weird obelisk everywhere that just looks like a display item in a cheesy mall or <laughs> or it kind of looks like um, just like a sculpture. You know what I mean? Um, so but this is all signaling to the aliens coming who are going to say they created everybody. And of course, we have. A lot of the Muslim teachers who are teaching about your angels and my black horse ride video goes into the whole angel thing and now this is not to say I'm not trying to put my sisters down who are in these other religions but we know the truth that even Malcolm X knew that we were Israel and that meant being Israel not anybody else not being Kemet not being Islam those are not Israel and so I'm not trying to defame or put anybody down. But the thing is, is that as Israel raises up, we're taking territory in the spirit realm. We're taking the territory of the angels as we awaken. And they're falling out. They're falling down. They're looking for someone to worship them. Because basically, they're going to switch places with us, with those of us, the called out ones. They're going to come down to earth. And so they're looking for people to worship them. Now, that's not to say that we don't have angels. It says, in this time when we seek the ancient path, no longer will your teachers withdraw themselves from you, but they shall say, here is the way, walk there in it. And so those are probably your guardian angels who are our brothers. And they were very clear to say, do not bow down. That scripture that I quote in Isaiah 45, I think it says, it's when um, I... Or, no, it's his Ezekiel, is it? Isaiah. And he's bowing down to this angel and he says, don't bow down before me. Okay, clear message. Don't worship me. Worship Yah. Worship Yah for the spirit of Hamashiach is prophecy. So we don't worship angels. We don't focus on them. We only focus on Yahuwah and his son, Yeshua, who came to redeem us and marry us. And Israel. when those angels come down, that is when the man of sin is revealed. They're coming down saying that they've created the human race and this is now the man of sin. And this is now Hasetan and everything being revealed. Okay, okay. so I'm just saying this out of love for Yasharel and even for those of you who are in these belief systems Israel is not Kemet or Africa or, or Islam. Israel is a Shemitic, different people, and we are the children of Yah. 
and anybody is welcome into the family if they so choose. And my prayer really, as I've been talking, um, is, is I have to be clear about this because there's some women that I absolutely love their analysis and stuff. And they're either, they don't have any religion or they're teaching Islam and, or they're, they're looking at seven nations, seven ways, you know, you can be like, yeah, or, you know, and it's, of course we war against seven nations. So that's clear. They're going to have seven ways, right? That's a false religion. But nonetheless, there are sisters I listen to out there who I consider my sisters and I love. And so, again, I ask you, family, as I mentioned earlier in the video, please pray for them. Okay? We send out prayers and love and transformation and faith and hope because guess what? Yeah, it's bringing everybody out and going now. And so when they get into the wilderness, we want them to be encouraged and to be able to wake up when they actually see the true creator. And so this is nothing against them. It's just that, you know, the fallen ones are coming down and you do not want them to be asking you to worship them and do not want to be following them. You want to follow Yah. And so we really want to stay away from that. But once again, back to the song, we want to praise Yah. And, and you'll note that there's different styles of music in it. There's swing, bossa nova, um, kind of a jazzy blues and reggae. And so this is, it's like what he, he kind of showed me, what I saw was that this is a song of the four corners. You know how the four, the tw 12 tribes were in a four pronged uh, configuration like a tree. And so they are the tree of life. And watch my video on the tree for that. But, uh, and when I was a little girl and people used to ask me how old I was, I'd say, I'm tree, I'm tree. So don't ever do tree with this wrong, bad. No, people are doing that now. They're doing that for three. No, it's tree like this is tree. It's a tree because your fingers should look like a tree. But anyway, I digress. Um, so yeah, so it's the song of the four corners uh, eventually it should all be in Hebrew and we should all be able to learn the Hebrew, but ma mainly found me, this is war because this is the promise he just revealed to me. I had this, um, beginning and end of a different Psalm on this because he wants that's to speak to us where we are now to let him know that we are a seal upon his heart, upon his arm and that his love is stronger than death. You know, that, that Yah is going to resurrect Israel from the, from the grave and from the four corners of the earth. And his jealousy is more persistent than the grave, than even death. He's jealous for you, Israel. So he wants you to understand the passion and the love he, and the power that he's going to bring up to bring you out. You know, like a man who wants to deliver and save the one he, the wife he loves. And he will not rest until he redeems Israel. And no amount of nations, no many waters can quench this love. So that's why that was included with it. Um, so I hope that this blesses you. And, you know, I tried to run the lyrics along through this. And so um, feel free to like, subscribe, and share. You can make donations at Live Light Well. And as I said in the beginning, you can also just do donations in the Super Chat too. Uh, I, I mean, I think it works. I don't know. I'm not sure, but, um, but anyway, so what I want to do is better produce this song. This is it. And I hope you enjoy it and may Yah bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine on you. May he be gracious, lift the light of his countenance and give you peace. And remember you can get the Moed appointed times calendar on my webpage at live light. Well, and you can also get um, the book Chaya Eat Life and Fast. Okay. So I look forward to seeing you there. I, don't, I can't remember what else I had to say about this song. Um, anyway, I, I wrote it in basically one week. Yah gave me the verse that you see Yahuwah and the opening and the ending, uh, in one night, like at like about one o'clock in the morning and, between midnight and one kind of thing. And then, um, then throughout the week, I just kind of worked on it. So it's been all told like about seven days. 
that it took. So uh, obviously I need to, you know, massage it and stuff like that. And I had a few glitches there because it's my first time I'm reading it from a paper. That's why you see me looking down. So that's what's going on. But I hope it blesses you. Baruch Atah. And um, thank you, family. And I'll see you in the next one. So this is for your hope and edification. And remember, praising Yah, knowing his name, and having the joy of Yahuwah, joy of gladness, which is your strength. That is the precious oil that is in your lap. Hallelujah.